Speaker, Dr. Collier Rotson. Collier graduated from here from the Department of Geology and Geophysics in 2007. Wow, time is flying. Uh, before that, he got his master's and bachelor from the University of Kiel in Germany. And uh, since the graduation, has been working with us and with the USGS Pacific Island Water Science Center. And he's a uh, um, top notch groundwater modeler and then been very active in the area. He worked in many, many projects and with us here and during his. Uh, uh, studies in his uh, PhD work. And most of his work has to do with parameter estimation using tidal and uh, water plumbing uh, data. And also now he's very active in uh, assessing conditions under uh, future climate change, as you will see here today, as well as uh, assessing aquifer uh, reaction to plumbing. While he was a student, he got uh, some awards, including our famous Stearns and Watermall Scholarship, I fellowship and scholarships. And he has published many papers in uh, scientific journals and many, many technical reports. And actually, technical reports from the US, USGS are peer reviewed, so they are very valuable uh, publications. Okay, without further ado, Colin. Thank you for inviting me. I uh, have a I'm going to talk about two specific things, two specific groundwater problems. So it will be two sections of the talk. The first half I'm going to talk about borehole flow, and the second half I'm going to talk about groundwater inundation and uh, the effects of uh, sea level rise on, on groundwater. And so let's first start with the <coughs> borehole flow. And uh, this is actually a section of a talk I gave at the HWWA conference last year. And, but I thought there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff in it that I, um, it's worth repeating for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, and that uh, the main issue about borehole flow is that you have deep monitor wells on the ground, which basically connect vertically the aquifer from the salt water to the freshwater. And while in the normal case you have a layered basalt aquifer, which would keep the horizontal or the vertical flow rather low, um, that these open conduits, you create, you're creating a pathway for, for salt water or brackish water to come up into areas where you don't want to have it. And so that's, that's the main problem. So here's a <coughs> typical cross-section of a volcanic rock aquifer on Oahu. You have volcanic rock as your main <coughs> source of where your aquifer sits in. And you do have a uh, cap rock, which are coastal sediments um, that are of lower permeability, that are confining the, um, the aquifer and the volcanic rock, and um, also impede the outflow of um, fresh water, which is accumulating as a lens inland, um, hindering that outflow to the ocean. So with that cap rock, you do get a thicker lens, which is very unique to our aquifers here on Oahu, which provides a lot of fresh water um, for drinking water purposes. Now, um, what we also see on this picture is the freshwater lens, and between the freshwater lens and the saltwater, the transition zone, if you now run a salinity profile through these entire zones, it would look something like this, where you do have the freshwater on the top part, and you do have a gradual transition onto saltwater, and uh, the thickness of that zone, <coughs> of, the, of the mixing zone, depends on um, tidal fluctuations, of course, pumping too, and other fluctuations that fresh water lens. Um, mostly tides determine the, the, the thickness of that, of that mixing zone. And uh, the further inland you go, uh, the less tides you have, and this, the, this, the narrower this mixing zone is. Um, here is a um, data collected by the state on, uh, in, uh, on Maui, in the deep Marana well. And uh, these deep monitor wells are, are open, uncased wells. So there's nothing that prevents the water to go in at any point. So you can have access of the water into the well at any point. And uh, these are a lot of profiles taken between 1985 and 2008. Blue ones are the early ones, and the red ones are the newest ones in 2008. And uh, 
What do you see in this picture? Not only that you do have your fresh water on top, you have your transition zone, and then you have your salt water at the bottom, but what happens over time? Shallower. Shallower. The transition zone moves up, or the midpoint, the basically the fresh water lens is shrinking. So you do, over time, get a shallow lens. Why is that? We're pumping. Getting water out of the ground for agriculture and for um, drinking water purposes, and so that lens is shrinking. There's not enough recharge coming in to replenish that lens over time. So we're basically taking out more than we do, uh, then we then it's then it's uh, recharged. And what is that again? Is that a borehole or is it that's salinity profile? No, but what from is a borehole. Deep, yes, is a borehole. It's it's an open. They call the deep monitor wells, and these are usually wells that are penetrate all the way through the transition zone into the salt water. Do they, just a technical question, do they pack them along the way to separate the layers? No, they just Nothing. go it's, down to a it's certain base, just, It's not even cased. Yeah. Oh, it's, just, right. it's just rock on the sides. Right. And most of them, there's a few ones that are cased, but most of them aren't cased. Mm. Um, so, in order to track the freshwater lens thickness and in order to um, track your uh, water resources over time, um, there's two parameters that are uh, measured, which is the top of the transition zone, which is determined by the 2% um, seawater salinity, here shown as the blue line, and the 50% um, salinity. So over time, you can measure the depth of each of these parameters, and you can determine where your midpoint of the transition zone is, that one clearly moves up, and the top of the transition zone that moves also up is, and you can have a good idea of uh, what your water resources are doing. That's the idea. But, um, uh, okay, oh, that's, that's too early for the but. But, um, um, so you're not only using those to look at uh, how much water you have, you're also using these um, profiles to calibrate um, 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 Sustainable yield to an estimate sustainable yield for so the water department, the water commission does it, and uh, is basing it based on these profiles on uh, how much water can be pumped from the aquifer. Um, they're also used to calibrate neurological groundwater models. That's the state of the art right now, where um, um, the water supply and other entities are um, paying to get these large. 3D models constructed to simulate what happens if we're pumping more or less, if you're pumping here, if you're pumping there, what happens to our water resources. In order to calibrate them, you need water levels and you need salinity profiles. So this is one of the things that models are calibrated with. So they're very useful um, for modeling, um, and therefore the data is, is pretty much crucial uh, to have. Um, so these have all of these, the data that's collected um, is very, very important. Um, here is a picture of a deep marina well in, um, that's uh, in Pearl Harbor, and uh, it's Daryl from the border water supply who is uh, preparing his logger. They're lowering a CTD into it and uh, uh, pulling it back out. They're doing that, what was it? I think there's a quarterly water commission. Most doing it quarterly is doing it uh, two times a year now, is that right? Well, we do it quarterly. Quarterly two, right now, okay. Uh, that's good. And um, so they're uncased. There's not even there's no casing between the wall of the of the aquifer, so to say, and the water inside the well. Uh, to give you an idea how many of these deep marine wells we have, um, this is a map that's showing the green ones are drilled between 68 and 98, and then the red ones are more recent between 99 and 2008. And uh, as you see everywhere, where um, there's a lot of um, groundwater pumping going on in the area of the developed areas, we do have a lot of wells, mostly Pearl Harbor, of course, if you're on the North Shore and the East Side too, and on the other islands also a few. Um, and, but the main thing is, there's millions of dollars invested in drilling these holes, and uh, a lot more money now even put into the whole thing to um, monitor um, the salinity in these wells. Um, and the question is, how good are these? What, what, what do they even tell us? So are they even working the way they were designed? Do they give us exactly what we want to know? And so the issue is, what happens if you do have flow inside the well? Meaning that water is moving vertically, either up or down, that's been shown here in this thing, and not telling us the salinity of the aquifer, but telling us the salinity of the well. Then we're not measuring what we want to measure, right? And so, how can we get flow in the well? Well, first of all, um, 
you could uh, uh, vertical hydraulic gradient of the aquifer, and if you t take any textbook in hydrology, and you put like, well, what's groundwater flow like? Mostly, they say it's horizontal, and that is true, because, and that's also the Dupuis assumption that you assume the, um, the flow is mostly horizontal because the gradient is not that large compared to, um, that, that would take into account, that you have to take into account to, to, um, for your analytical solutions. However, in a normal system of, a, of, a, of an aquifer, you do have areas where water comes down as recharge in your inland areas, and then that's where, where the flow and vertical component rather is downward, and then the water travels mostly horizontal through the aquifer, but at the coastline, if you go back to our initial profile, the water would come up, going upwards, and you'd have rather an upward component to your, um, just into your normal um, flow pattern through the aquifer. And that could be enough to cause water to be displaced inside these wells. Relative to the surrounding rock? Yes. Because there's a big contrast in permeability. permeability. Right. It's a lot easier to have vertical flow through an open hole than through the aquifer. Because the, the way how it's layered, um, the, the, the hydraulic conductivity um, is a lot larger in the in the horizontal direction than in the vertical direction because of these different layers. And do they sample at multiple depths when they sample? They sample at every depth. Every it just depth. goes down and you get a lot of points. Uh, oh, it's uh, like a bridge uh, conductivity measure. It's a CTD. Yeah. CTD. Okay. And so, um, also, what could call what other what other uh, reasons could be um, to to cause vertical flow in the bore borehole? Well, you can pump. What's wrong with this picture that you can see here? I have the production well here, and I have my deep water well here. I think it's seven meters. So, pump in here. On the, you're somewhere up here with your, with your pumped interval, right? You're pumping water. Where do you get the water from? How likely is it that water gets drawn out of that deep water well up into that area versus you would get all the fresh water from the top because you assume the horizontal flow is much larger than your vertical. Yeah? Where is that picture? That's Punanani in the Pearl Harbor. Um, so, um, how can we tell if we do have borehole flow? Well, there is a very easy way to look at it. Uh, if you assume that, uh, in, um, in theory, your salinity increases gradually with depth. And uh, so this is shown here as the depth dotted line. You go down, and the further you go down, the more salinity you have. Now, if we do have, let's assume this is our upward flow case, we have some sort of area where we have more water provided to the well, or a good permeable zone where water can easily flow out of the aquifer into the well. And we do have this upward flow gradient. Say you're pumping up in this area, or you just have the vertical hydraulic gradient in the coastal area that's pointing upward. It doesn't matter. It just goes upward, and it's a lot easier for the water to flow through the well than to flow through this zone, which is rather thick and not so permeable. It doesn't provide too much inflow from the side into the well. And you would have another area up there in this area where water flows out of the well. And how would that salinity profile look like? You'd see a step. So this would be, the salinity would be unchanged in the area where you're in the borehole traveling upwards. And as soon as you're mixing with the surrounding aquifer water again, where it flows out, it would show as this horizontal line. And of course, you can show, we observed this in the field. So here is the same well I just showed you under no pumping conditions. After two days, you see the green profile. And pumping at 12 million gallons a day, you see the red profile. Obviously, we do see this, oops, sorry, we do see this large step developing. And I think if you wait longer for two days, longer than two days, the green profile would even go further in and would just even be more relaxed. So obviously, the nearby pumping causes um, uh, not only bore, upward borehole flow, but also causes a very distinctive profile in the in the, uh, the distinctive step that we can see in the profile and um, and see the salinity displaced over at least 400, uh, 350 feet maybe, 
But you see a lot of small steps in there. I mean, it's because the aquifer is not uniform and you have zones that provide more water than others, but such a large step, I don't think a single lava flow would be so dense and over 350 feet thick. That doesn't make any sense. So you would have to have some other force that moves the water inside the well and overcomes everything that um, would provide water to the well. And now I'm going back to the thing that's monitored, the 2% um, freshwater, uh, the, uh, the top of the transition zone, the 2% seawater salinity. If you start monitoring this, well, if you're monitoring under pumping conditions, it would be at 120 feet below sea level, uh, below sea level. and if it's not a pumping, it'd be somewhere at 150, 180 feet. Okay, this is not a good example for that specific thing, but, but you see what I'm saying. It's not the same if you're measuring under pumping and not pumping conditions, which means the data you're getting is not reliable. Um, now, the other parameter that's been tracked is the 50% salinity. Um, it's so deep that at this point, the pumping nearby doesn't have a huge effect. It, it looks even like uh, during pumping, it's a little bit, uh, um, I don't know, it's a little bit higher, but it's not, it's not relevant. So it's not several hundred feet. If it's two feet or three feet up, that's not a really big deal. But if you have several hundred feet going up, then that's a big deal. Um, there's another case that we saw that we see a lot. So we do see steps in the profile. Not all of them could be relate, uh, um, Not all of them could be related to nearby pumping, but maybe far away pumping would create enough. Um, 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 vertical flow in the aquifer that would, that would cause this. But in this case, you do have this large step, but it doesn't affect your 2% seawater salinity. So whether you're pumping or not, or whether the step is there or not, you measure always your top of the transition zone kind of at 450 feet. Um, so this large step, this large displacement of salinity in the well um, does not affect your measurement. So I'm giving these two different cases uh, yellow, triangle for the ones that are not affected, although you do see a large step, and the ones that do affect the 2% salinity as the red triangle. And looking at a map where we do see these uh, cases, um, it's kind of obvious that in the area where most of the pumping happens, you do see the largest displacement of, um, of, uh, of salinity um, associated with the, or right at that point where you have the top of the transition zone measurement or the depth that you're tracking. So basically, um, due to the whole area of large groundwater pumping, you're creating um, vertical flow in the borehole, and you're basically destroying the data that you want to measure. Isn't there a conductive length scale within which the observation hole has to be relative to the pumping hole for that effect to be important? Um, in other words, they have to be really close together. Within no, they don't have to be close together. I saw um, there's a, especially in these areas in the, in the, in um, what's that called in um, in um, Honolulu, uh, where you do have these what they call compartmentalized aquifers, where you have valley fields on either side, you have the cap rock in the front, and the water level doesn't vary too much inland. Um, the gradient is not as distinctive as in other areas. There you also do see um, pumping, or you see cases where you have pumping nearby and it doesn't affect it, and you do see cases where there's no well nearby and you do see large, you see large steps. So um, it's not entirely clear. For example, South Halaba would be a case. There's there's the Halaba shaft, which is I mean almost a mile away. Um, but right next to the prison, there's a demarino well. You do see large steps, but there's not really, in the immediate vicinity, there's no other pumping well. So that could represent a difference in the conduct, conductive length scale, then. I, would, I would think. Yeah, it's, it's, wanna, yeah, it could be, but there could be several factors that affect it. Mm. So I don't think, um, I think the, 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 the gradient, um, <coughs> the aquifer alone already produces uh, I mean, this open conduit already produces such an easier way to go up or down. There is videos that actually I want to. That would be a nice thing to include into the into the talk. Um, there's video of the Water Commission collected video of these demarinated wells, and you see a lot of stuff flowing 
in all sorts of directions. And it's, it's very interesting that <laughs> to look at those um, because you can actually visualize that you see particles and it's just, it's just moving. It's just not stagnant at one point. Then. So, um, why is this important? Well, of course, because we do want to know where our, where our fresh fire lens uh, um, how our fresh fire lens is going, or where our fresh fire lens is going over time, and if we have enough water to drink, because this is our main aquifer, our main resource to, to get drinking water from. And um, so this is a picture of where the midpoint of the transition zone, so the 50% of the seawater salinity it was in 2008 and 2009. And uh, <coughs> the good news is the aquifer has a very thick fresh water lens due to that cap rock in front of it. Um, at some areas, it's almost a thousand feet below sea level at that point, which means you have a very thick fresh water lens. And now, um, whether your monitoring is right or wrong, the midpoint seems to be a lot less um, affected by these uh, by the nearby pumping, and um, and this still provides a very good uh, indication that we have enough water to drink. Now, the top of the transition zone, of course, is more problematic to monitor, but um, um, the midpoint, I think, is still very, uh, very, very conclusive. So, if you just look at the midpoint over time, but now look at the time frame between '99 and 2009. Um, I chose that time frame because, first of all, there's enough a lot of data that has been collected during that time. But second, also the pumping rates were fairly um, steady over the last 10 years. And uh, so, I'm grouping two different aquifers. Um, Kind of what I said before, the area where you have a lot of pumping. So everywhere you have the withdrawal in those 10 years that's larger than 75% of the sustainable yield, what's been designated by the Water Commission. Um, I call those the highly developed aquifers. And uh, the set in this group sees a mean rate of change of the midpoint around um, three and um, a little over three feet per year. So every year the midpoint is going to move three feet up within this area. And okay, Maui also, same thing. It's not, there's not too many wells to distinguish that. Um, and the other ones, uh, the less developed aquifers, the midpoint moves up about half that rate, 1.6 feet per year. So um, that already also tells you, which is, I mean, this is not really rocket science, because clearly the more you pump, the more you bring that transition zone up. That's obvious. But uh, just to give you an idea of how much that really is. But actually, Kolya, it looks like, I think we talked about this before, other seminar, looks like the sustainable yield estimates are wrong, right? Possibly. It's not, <laughs> it's not sustainable, right? I mean, um, well, if you have a thousand feet of, uh, well, if you say, okay, 50% seawater, 50% uh, fresh water, so 50% uh, seawater, so you can't drink that. But, um, but the fresh water lens is still very thick. Um, if you keep going on that rate and the recharge goes down, I think that's the biggest problem. So if the recharge, I think, stays the same, I think it would be sustainable, but with the, with the um, climate predictions we have, we're probably going to get less rain overall. And that would mean rather drought conditions, which would mean less, um, 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 or less fresh water recharge and uh, less fresh water to drink. The only good news would be that maybe agriculture is not taking us as much. I mean, for example, the pumping rates they had in the 80s for sugarcane, that was certainly not sustainable. I mean, that was just beyond sustainable. But uh, with all the sugarcane going down and with the uh, more building houses being built, that uses a lot less water than what they had in the, in the era of the sugarcane. Okay, so these are the this is just the these are the conclusions for the um, oral flow, um, just as the as the as the um, the problem pretty much. It's kind of still an introduction because I want to go to the modeling, which is the next subject. Um, so this is all published in that report, and I'll just quickly summarize. So we do see these steps as indicators of borehole flow in the in the profile. We also see downward steps. I only showed you an upward step, but there's also cases where we do see downward. Uh, um, Flow. Um, these, uh, the borehole flow, and uh, specifically the top of the transition zone, which is used as an indicator for fresh water lens thickness, can be displaced several hundred feet um, in the deep marina well. It's mostly near the pumping centers. And a lot better way to measure salinity at depth would be piezometers. So they're only open at one single point, 
and you'll have several of those, say you have one at this depth, one at that depth, and one at that depth, and there, there's no other way of water flowing in at that point. So you would have no borehole flow coming in and changing the salinity at that point. So you would always know what the salinity at this point would be. Uh, however, those are a lot more expensive to build. Retrofitting existing demarter wells would be also very expensive. Although possible, I mean, you could you have a large hole, you've seen it, it's full of diameter, and you can, you can fit several tubes in there and just open them at several intervals. So possibly possible, but costly. But that certainly would tell you uh, what the salinity would be at depth without any borehole floor. And uh, on monitoring the midpoint, the 50% salinity is still useful because it does not seem to be affected by borehole flow. Um, at least not enough to, uh, to alter the data. And so what I found looking at the changes of fresh water lens thickness if it's, um, if it's used, uh, if it's um, monitored with the midpoint of the transition zone um, shows that you have faster rates in um, highly developed areas, about three feet per year, and slower rates in the less developed areas, about half of that. So, we still have more questions. This is the model I showed you, or the, the, the whole conceptual model that I showed you, what happens downward flow, upward flow. But there's one thing that we haven't really, um, really answered. How does a regional flow affect the salinity? I mean, I can look at pumping, and not pumping and see these large steps and so but what happens if the entire thing is shifted it's always shifted so i have no way of comparing it pumps i can turn off i can see what the conditions are without pumping and i can see how it relaxes and i can say okay this is how much i see but if i have just the regional flow going down in the aquifer here causing downward flow going up in the aquifer in the coastal area causing the upward flow but it's constantly happening there's no way to turn it off how would i ever know and so to answer that question, we thought, well, let's do a little numerical modeling exercise and see if we can uh, model that. And so I used a, a quasi, <coughs> as a 3D model, but I only modeled the cross section from here to here, but I had to extend it out to that side because we um, want to include the radial flow into the well. And so I'm modeling three different <coughs> monitor wells. And I'm, the way I modeled them is I made the grid smaller and smaller, so I was down to the, the grid size was down, was basically um, the same size as the, the well itself. So I was modeling the well as a single or as a, as a, as a row of um, cells and having three different monitor wells, one inland, one in the middle, and one in the coastal area. And um, we're calibrating these with water levels and measured salinities in the Pearl Harbor area. And this is the cross section of the model with the boundary conditions. The main thing that are included here are the cap rock in front of it. And you do have, you see how the grid refines around the area of your Demarna wells. And uh, basically the hydraulic conductivity within the, within the Demarna well is uh, very large. So you would have no resistance uh, as for vertical flow. And so here's uh, how we calibrated it. <coughs> of course, what you do is you try to match your model with um, uh, observed water levels. Now, taken 3D water levels from this area and from that area onto a 2D cross section, of course, will not produce a perfect fit, especially if you have lower water levels in the east, uh, in the west, compared to the east, with the same, same distance to the shoreline. And so you do have a little bit of scatter, but overall water levels reproduced by the model are <coughs> acceptable. And salinity profiles, we do have, this is the left side shows salinity in the uh, coastal deep Mario well. This is between the two, and this is uh, in the middle well. We don't have any salinity profiles in the inland area where I designated my third uh, deep Mario well. But uh, we can, at least with these three, we can uh, model the transition zone. And you can see how different it is. You do see steps. These are large steps <coughs> in uh, demarter wells. Um, borehole flow. This one clearly is borehole flow. South Alava, very good example. And um, but overall, our measured, our sim uh, simulated salinity, the black line, represents pretty good um, what we're having, um, what the what the salinity is in the aquifer. Here's a cross section of the of the model showing the seawater salinity, freshwater lens, uh, transition zone getting thinner the further you go inland. 
I modeled four different cases. I'm not going to present all four of them. This is going to take too much time. I'll only show you the first one. Uh, if you're interested, you can read the report. All of them are described in there. So the first one I'm going to describe you <coughs> is just a homogeneous aquifer, no additional withdrawals, uh, basically simulating the natural hydraulic gradient in the aquifer and see what kind of displacement we're getting in our wells. And the other ones have pumping nearby, far away, and uh, nearby, <coughs> but with the um, heterogeneous aquifer by trying to include these smaller um, steps at different levels. So our first case that I'm showing you is the, is the homogeneous ozone aquifer, no withdrawals, just a regional aquifer flow. And uh, first, the dotted lines are the simulated, <coughs> salin uh, simulated salinity of the three wells. And now we're having our observed um, um, salinity. And it's not really much difference. We do see uh, four feet midpoint displacement, about 17 feet of the top of the transitional displacement, but not 150 or 400 feet or even 600. I think the largest step is 660 feet long. So a displacement of 600 feet. Um, so that's nothing that we do see in the, in the homogeneous aquifer. Um, the other well, um, profiles are <coughs> very much the same. So it's not really too much of a displacement. And if you compare the average salinity from the midpoint upwards, you only see an increase of 0.7% uh, um, seawater salinity in the borehole. Also, that is not really much. Yes. I'm confused. What's causing the difference if there's no pumping? The hydraulic gradient. Okay. So we do see upward flow throughout the borehole, and you do see a mixing or a change of salinity, but it's not. So you do see the, um, uh, but it's not. Um, yeah, it's not as much as you would use. Uh, as we observe in the in the cases um, around it. So um, the good thing is that the regional aquifer flow without any local withdrawals causes <coughs> horizontal flow in the basal aquifer, and we don't really see much more than one percent of salinity um, difference. The maximum displacement of 70 feet, and uh, the other scenarios that I didn't show you um, pretty much show that the greater the withdrawal rates are, the closer the withdrawal locations are, the more bowl flow and the more salinity displacement you have. But that's obvious. I mean, it's, uh, we just can quantify it with, that, with the model. But then you're still using a homogeneous aquifer, which we don't have. So it's not, this is just <laughs> an extension of uh, the idea. However, we can incorporate the heterogeneity of the, of the aquifer and have several layers of different conductivity by trying to match um, the vertical long steps that we have in several profiles. Um, so it's possible to do that. However, if you do a 3D dimensional model, it's not advisable to, to use that at that small scale um, because if you have a regional model, you cannot really incorporate so many layers and so many different things. Um, it would kind of defeat the purpose. So. But we know that the, but, uh, we can still use those profiles to calibrate our regional models. 1% uh, error in salinity profiles is certainly acceptable for calibrating a numerical model. So that's the good news. We can still use those. And we can still use the midpoint to <coughs> track our fresh water and thickness. So to summarize this, the top of the transition zone can be displaced several hundred feet near the pumping centers. And the long-term long monitoring of the midpoint is useful. Um, this was already I had that before. 